Number 5. The face of Senwasrit III is one of the most individual and recognizable in all of Egyptian art. The deep set, heavy lidded eyes, the thin lips, and the series of diagonal furrows marking the rather hollow cheeks give representations of this king of brooding expression not usually found on the faces of Egyptian kings, who are generally portrayed with a more youthful countenance. Although it lacks any inscription, this fragment of a quartzite statue is easily identified as a likeness of Senwasrit III. However, unlike the stern features seen on the face of the king's nay sphinx, the expression here is somewhat softened suggesting the face of a living, aging man. This image is one of the few instances in Egyptian art in which the ruler seems consciously to have chosen to represent his humanity rather than an idealized image of eternal kingship. Number 4. This quartzite head once belonged to a composite statue made of several different materials. Based on the color of the stone, red being the conventional color for men, the owner was originally identified as Akhenaten. However, the subject seems to have worn the standard tripartite wig, which frames the face with two thick hanks of hair, while a third section hangs down the back. This wig and the very close similarity of the face to known images of Akhenaten's mother, Queen Ta, make it virtually certain that she is represented here. The sensitive modeling of the face is typical of the workshop of the sculptor Thutmose at site of Amarna. The existence of gypsum plaster casts excavated in Thutmose's studio suggests that this may have been part of a group statue depicting Akhenaten with his parents, Tai, and a menhood of three. Number 3. Only the head of what was once a rather large bronze statuette is preserved. Examination has shown that the material is a black bronze, an ancient patination that would heighten precious metal inlays and that the statue had an iron armature. The king has the single arc brow line and a generally idealized appearance that is found for kings of the 4th century through at least Ptolemy II. However, compared to 4th century kings, the wider eyes and somewhat thicker and flatter lips represent new tendencies, best understood in the context of changes happening in the period of Ptolemy II and III. Number 2. This head once belonged to the statue of an unidentified female deity. The gender is suggested by the lack of a beard, and the simple hairstyle points to the divine status of the subject. Mortal women wore elaborately curled wigs at the time this piece was carved. The complete statue represented the goddess seated or standing, either alone or as part of a group of two or more deities and possibly the king. Number 1. This head is a fragment from a statue group that represented a god seated on a throne with the young King Tutankham in front of him. The king's figure was considerably smaller than that of the god, indicating his subordinate status in the presence of the deity. All that remains of the god is his right hand, which touches the back of the king's crown in a gesture that signifies Tutankham's investiture as king. During coronation rituals, various types of crowns were put on the king's head. The type represented here, probably a leather helmet with metal discs sewn onto it, was generally painted blue and is commonly called the blue crown. The ancient name was Kepresh. Statue groups showing a king together with gods had been created since the Old Kingdom and formal groups relating to the pharaoh's coronation were dedicated at Karnak by Hatshepsut and other rulers of Dynasty 18. The Metropolitan's head of Tutankham with the hand of the god is special because of the intimacy with which the subject is treated. The face of the king expresses a touching youthful earnestness, and the hand of the god is raised toward his crown with gentle care. 